Hi everyone, I want to talk to you about GCSPDD. GCSPDD means glucose 6-phosphate dihydrogenase deficiency. Have you heard about that before? Or someone close to you is already diagnosed with that? Okay, let's go. There are examples of defects that are very similar to GCS PDD and they are glucose 6-phosphate dihydrogenase deficiency like I've just mentioned that is number one and close to that is 6P GDD as if you are reversing the letters uh, in the first case like GCS PDD reversed so 6P GDD that is 6 phosphate gluconate dihydrogenase deficiency also we have gamma glutamine cysteine synthetase deficiency and glutathione synthetase deficiency all the above are the possible enzyme defects found in azos monophosphate shunt pathway and glutathione pathway don't mind my biochemical terms today that is what the disease is all about so they are meant to protect the red blood cells from oxidant injury but the deficiency could be inherited and anyone with those deficiencies will have lifelong hemolytic anemia there is possibility of hemolysis on exposure to certain agents. Very soon you come across the list of the agents in question. GCS PDD, that is glucose 6-phosphate dihydrogenase deficiency, is the commonest of all the red blood cells and zymatic defects very common among Jews, Blacks, and they are called African Americans if you are in the United States, found in Thailand, in Chinese, and among Indians. It is believed to be associated with malaria endemicity, and it is X-linked inheritance. I will talk more about X-linked inheritance of GCSPD son. Career mothers will pass it to the male offspring who will be affected. But sometimes we we'll find few females that have GCSPD. It's not common among females. But when they have inheritance of homozygous alleles for GCSPD, they will calm down with disease. There are different classes of glucose 6-phosphate dihydrogenase deficiency. Class 1. Class 1 will have less than 10% of normal enzymes. In other words, they have about 90% of normal enzymes. So they have defects in 90% of them of it so it is very severe in them and hemolysis in them is chronic that is class one in class two though they have just less than 10 percent normal enzymes but they have less severe hemolysis with only intermittent hemolysis and that is very common among those living in the middle east or Mediterranean region. Class 3, they have about 10 to 60 percent normal enzyme. They have moderate problems and intermittent hemolysis. This is very common among Africans, among blacks. The class 4, they have no deficiency 
no enzyme defects, no hemolysis, then you can ask me why classifying them then? Well, it is not significant. Class 5, we actually have increased enzyme activity and it is not significant in them as well. Still on glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase, the Mediterranean, the group is found in the Middle East, the Mediterranean, and they have class 2 type characteristics. They have severe hemolysis when they are exposed to oxidants. The glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase African, that is glucose 6-phosphate dehydrogenase A, is found in blacks just from the nomenclature up there. They have class 3 clinical features sensitive to certain drugs and food items. You will soon find a list of the affected drugs and food items in a bit. They have shorter half-life span and the half-life is affecting the reticulocytes found in them. There's a variance in Asians. Different zones in China will have different types. What are the possible clinical features of GCSPD deficiency? One, it might be asymptomatic. So, they are detected accidentally or when someone else in the family is diagnosed with the disease and the rest members of family agree to be screened, then the diagnosis is made. So it could be asymptomatic. And when there are symptoms, then we're going to find symptoms of hemolysis. Acute hemolytic anemia is very common, and that is worse in those in Mediterranean. Hemoglobin A1C is falsely lower. If they have diabetes mellitus and you are screening for the treatment, improvement, or you want to make the diagnosis and you screen for hemoglobin A1C, it is going to be lower because the red blood cells produces rapid or rapidly replaced. Hence, the three months test will likely yield lower value in them because the red blood cell has rapid turnover. They're easily replaced. And by the time you do your a hemoglobin A1C, it's going to be falsely low in them. Hemolysis on exposure to certain medication and food items, this is the second time I'm going to talk about it right now. But in a bit, I'll give you the entire list. Infection will increase hemolysis. Let me talk more about that. If everybody should be having in, an infection and an individual with GCSPD is also having the same infection the same day, the same hour, the rest members of the populace may not have hemolysis or if I thought they do, might not be significant. But infection and GCSPD there's likelihood of hemolysis. And when it occurs, it's likely going to be more severe in them than the rest population. Of course, jaundice. When there's hemolysis, we're bound to find unconjugated bilirubin and jaundice. There's possibility of neonatal jaundice in newborns with GCSPD. So sometimes when a child or neonate, that is the people given birth to between day 0 to 28, those are the neonates. So if you found jaundice in them, as we are screening for possible causes, if this is from a family where GCSPD could be a differential, 
it will be wise to screen for that. Parlor for the same reason, because when there's hemolysis and the blood, blood level shuts down, particularly red blood cells, then we have parlor. Upper bilirubinemia for the same reason, when there is excess bilirubin in the system, then we'll find another problem called canicteros. Canicteros, there will be you know, deep, high pitch cry, uh, and then the posture of the baby will be obstetonous, and the baby can even die in the next few hours or days after then. Anemia will be associated, and there will be neutrophil dysfunction. How do we make diagnosis here? We can do Combs test, particularly when you have hemolysis and there's jaundice. You want to be sure you are not dealing with autoimmune hemolytic anemia. And in that case, it will be wise to have Combs test done. You can assay the glucose phosphate dehydrogenase itself. So GCSPD assay. It's possible. You do complete blood counts to know what is the future and reticular size because it's expected when there is hemolysis, the level of reticular size should rise. But if there's hemolysis with all the features and the reticular size count is not rising, then there is likely uh, the likelihood of problem going on with the bone marrow itself. Then you check for LDH, which is expected to rise. You check for aptoglobin, that is expected to drop. Okay, then you do your liver function test. You do a repeat glucose for say dehydrogenase assay after three months. If the result gotten at the first time is negative, and you are still suspicious that this is GCSPD deficiency, just tell the individual or the parents that, okay, I'll let you go in three months time, please, can you come? I'm still suspicious that there's GCSPD deficiency here. And then come back, take the sample again for GCSPD, I'll say, and it's likely that they're going to get the diagnosis to be GCSPD. So if it is negative today, repeat GCSPD assay the next three months. It's possible to have molecular or genetic or DNA screen. And confirmatory test is by assaying NADPH quantitatively. What are the possible differential diagnoses here? This could be pyruvate kinase deficiency. Not all the time that it's going to be GCSPD deficiency that will give us some of these clinical features. This could be sickle cell disease anemia. That there will be a cell representation on that, and it could be thalassemia or spherocytosis. Sometimes in the newborn, there's what we call hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. With that, we're going to have close features that will be pig in a neonate that is having GCSPD, just as we're going to find in hemorrhagic disease of the newborn. This could be as a result of traumatic birth, because you always look for differential diagnosis when there is a neonate with jaundice or massive bleeding somewhere, you look for possible differential. So it could be traumatic bed, for failure, liver failure, now that you're even dealing with jaundice, or by those obstruction somewhere. And if this is an adult or even becoming an elderly person before the diagnosis is made or whatever, you may be suspecting ampullary carcinoma or pancreatic CA, I mean, cancer of the head of the pancreas or prematurity if this is a newborn. Because if this is a premature 
baby, I mean, born before term, liver development might not be so full and will not be able to handle the production of bilirubin and metabolism of hemp and globin. The treatment. First thing first, avoid what you could avoid. Avoid some of these medications and food items. Prima Queen, unfortunately, GCSPD is already known to be associated with malaria, and Prima Queen is one of the medications for malaria treatment. But for my patient that is GCSPD, deficient, I will not encourage, I will not prescribe, I will not advise the individual to take Prima Queen. So Prima Queen off the table. Okay, GCSPD, deficient patient, having urinary tract infection, no nitrofurantoin, please take it off. No nitrofurantoin and GCSPD, the other time I said you want to assay your hemoglobin A1C in a diabetic patient, but this patient is having diabetes, your hemoglobin A1C could be falsely not negative, but um, you want to prescribe oral apoglycemic agent. This is type 2, right? No clopropamide, please. No Clopropamide. Pyroglotikase, no. Fava beans, no. Amine nitrate, no. Naphtaline, no. Methylene blue, contraindicated. So please, you can pause and go over this list on your own, please. If it is mild, you might not bother yourself to treat. But if the bilirubin level is very high, you can have phototherapy. And when it's extremely high, going close to the point of having kinetoros, you have a change blood transfusion. Phenobarbital would be good. Folic acid supplementation at the dosage of one milligram once daily is welcome here. Well, depending on the presentation and stability of the affected individual, intravenous fluid could be administered. Raspberry case is used for tumor lysis syndrome, and that will be useful here. Of course, from beginning, I made it clear that this is X-linked, so you have genetic counseling. Father will transmit it to his daughters. The daughters will be carriers. They will not be you know, exhibiting the disease, but they are carriers. They, in turn, will transmit it to their own sons. The sons will be affected. But remember, if there is homozygous allele inheritance, they have the two peers inherited, even as a female, the female will be affected. In conclusion, correct diagnosis is necessary, and that will lead to appropriate intervention. When we have correct diagnosis and appropriate intervention, we should expect an excellent outcome. Watch out for other presentations on conditions and associated with anemia, whether the enzymatic, membranous, hemoglobinopathies, and the lungs. Thanks for listening to my presentation. Kindly subscribe so that you can get all these immediately they are published. Thank you.